Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Top 10 Middle Game Ideas number 10, When All Else Fails, part two. Um, this is the last video in this series about When All Else Fails and also the last video in the entire middle game series. So I'll finish up with a recap uh, where to go from here section at the end of this video. Uh, but for now, I have a couple more examples of uh, searching, searching for middle game plans. Uh, Rod McNiven mentioned after the last video that uh, it's often a good idea uh, when you're looking for a plan in the middle game to try and think about what your opponent is uh, planning. And if you know what that is, maybe you can find a way to frustrate it. I think that's a good idea. In fact, it's um, a good idea in general. Almost everything I've talked about here uh, is sort of uh, double-edged. For example, loose pieces. Um, this could be your opponent's loose pieces that you're looking to exploit, but these, this could also be your own loose pieces that you should uh, think about, can he exploit them and do you need to protect them? So basically everything should be looked at from both points of view. And, uh, and also the, uh, this idea about your opponent's plan, you should look at that skeptically as well. It may be uh, that he has a good plan and you need to stop it, or it may be that uh, his plan isn't so great. Maybe there's a flaw in it that you can see, and uh, you really your best choice, your best course is to let him proceed with the plan, and then you can uh, spring your trap on him as he uh, as he follows a, uh, a wrong path. Uh, okay, that's it for this. Let's take a look at the first game here. The first game I wanted to show you was. Uh, played by uh, Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces against uh, Nils Grandelius at the uh, 83rd Tata Steel in 2021. So a recent game here. Carlsen started off with uh, e4, Grandelius goes uh, c5, knight f3, d6, we get uh, main line open Sicilian, d4, c takes, knight takes, knight f6, attacking the center pawn, defending, and then a6, the characteristic move of the knight orf. And now there are many uh, moves that have been tried here. Um, just in order of popularity, there's uh, bishop e3, there's bishop g5, there's bishop e2, there's bishop c4, there's uh, pawn to f4, there's pawn to f3, there's pawn to h3. H3 has been making a comeback recently. There's pawn to g3, there's pawn to a4. So all of those moves are more popular than the move that uh, Carlson chose in this position. He played the move um, queen to d3. So uh, a typical, uh, well, I can't say he does this all the time, but he does this uh, now and then when he wants to get his opponent out of a book, out of a book opening. He's found some move that uh, is not that popular, so uh, his opponent won't, won't have studied it very deeply. Um, but usually he's got uh, one or two ideas up his sleeve when he pulls out a move like this. So let's see how this uh, evolves. So e6 by Grandelius setting up a uh, Skaveningen pawn structure. Now a4, knight to c6. Carlson decides to trade here. And then um, there is this uh, backwards pawn left here. We'll see. Uh, it's a question how uh, black wants to deal with these pawns. Uh, which pawn will come forward, the C pawn, the D pawn, or the E pawn. Um, but Carlson comes up with a, another unusual move here, queen to G3. And uh, it has a point. If uh, Nils wanted to develop this uh, dark squared bishop and castle right away, he actually has to uh, wait a move uh, because he can't do it right away. Um, so bishop to B7, bishop to E2, and now, now he can develop. Now it's safe. And the difference is that... Um, Carlson has undefended this pawn by developing his bishop. So if uh, queen takes g7, there's rook to g8, and the rook will, will grab this pawn. So it's uh, it's all okay here, all okay to develop. And Carlson continues with bishop f4. So switches his attention. First his attention was on uh, this pawn. Now it's on this pawn. And in both cases, the pawns are defended, but by putting pressure on them, uh, black's forces are tied up. A little bit, and the knight. Uh, notice the knight can't come here to fork because this bishop on e2 is guarding that diagonal. So e5, uh, Nils decides to straighten his uh, or settle his pawn structure in the center by pushing the e pawn. And the bishop drops back to uh, e3, castles, castles, king to h8, a5. 
this is another uh, move that uh, fixes fixes a pawn. Uh, it prevents this pawn from coming forward by fixing. I mean, it locks it down, and so the bishop can't come out to uh, this diagonal. And this might be a target at some point. Um, knight goes to d7, rook f to d1. So notice the rook is pointing at the backwards pawn, so just probing at his opponent's weaknesses again. f5, e takes. And uh, Nils plays in an interesting way here. He could retake that pawn immediately, but uh, the pawn isn't really going anywhere. It's not so easy for uh, white to defend it. And, uh, and black can gain some time making some threatening moves in the center. So the d5 here threatens a fork. Knight runs. Uh, d4 threatens the bishop. The bishop runs. And then c5. So he's managed to build up this uh, strong center here. And uh, his position is looking not so bad. And this bishop, it's a fine bishop on that uh, light squared diagonal, striking all the way across the board, pointing at the king. But there is a slight price to pay here, and that is uh, he never rounded up this pawn, and Carlson will defend that pawn for a move at least to uh, force him to spend some time. I mean, it's like uh, Black got some free developing moves there, and now uh, Carlson wants to make him pay the price for those moves because he got those moves by neglecting to take this pawn back. Um, so bishop g5, uh, Grandelius decides to offer the dark squared bishop in trade and Magnus takes it. This brings the queen out, so now this pawn is getting rounded up. Uh, rook to e1 though, the rook shifts from one square to another, once again poking at a, uh, uh, focusing on a, uh, a backwards pawn. And then bishop to e4, he is an interesting move. Uh, Nils wants to round up this pawn in a convenient way. Uh, he could have just taken with the rook at that point, uh, or the queen if he wanted to offer a queen trade. So, uh, and Magnus plays bishop d3. I think this is an example of um, trading off your opponent's best piece. This bishop was, it was a great minor piece on this diagonal, and uh, Carlson is just uh, getting it off the board. Uh, Nils goes ahead and grabs the pawn, bishop takes, and uh, rook takes. So uh, he can later double rooks, and maybe maybe these guys are useful protecting along this, uh, this uh, fourth rank or fifth rank, depending on your point of view. Anyway, Carlson comes up with another uh, little plan here. He uh, drops the knight into b6. And uh, Grandelius decides he doesn't want to uh, uh, just passively defend the knight. He decides to trade it off. And, uh, you know, this, this pawn might be weak later, so maybe he can round it up. Um, but first he plays uh, h6, giving, giving the king some luft, so the king won't uh, escape. Uh, the queen runs back to d3, so maybe a little bit of shuffling with the queen. But it's um, targeting. I, it's not a nothing move, as I was talking about in the previous uh, video, because it actually does something. It's targeting a pawn. And then uh, rook to b8. This seems to be a slight mistake. Um, the chess engine is recommending the rook come all the way over to f8. So uh, counter counter the pressure on this pawn with the pressure on the f pawn. But uh, this is still, I guess, okay. Uh, rook takes a6. But this, this pawn may become a menace. But Grandelius has a plan for that. He drops back to f6. And then uh, Carlson, this is almost a nothing move, but not quite because it's a pawn move. He plays g3. This might be uh, in the category of a small strengthening move. That, that may be uh, uh, one way to look at it. But there's a, a secondary idea here that uh, I don't know if uh, Carlson was already thinking of it or he comes up with this later, but you'll see there's a, there's a use for that g3 move in a couple of moves. Anyway, after playing g3, he just lets this pawn go. Rook takes the pawn on b6, and there's a trade of rooks. And now uh, this pawn is hanging, but Carlson doesn't defend it, and instead he plays f4. And this is a, a nice idea, because if the pawn takes, then rook to the back rank. Now that the trade has lifted this rook off the back rank, rook to the back rank is mate. <laughs> because the queen is on that diagonal. So the pawn can't take. And um, 
and so uh, queen d8 was played the queen just runs and the the point of uh, if we back up a move the point of this uh, g3 move is that uh, the queen can't take the pawn if this pawn were still sitting here on g2 then this would be loose and the queen would just take it so that that g3 did prepare this uh, f4 move anyway the queen ran to d8 i just want to say the uh, chess engine would uh, play b3 here no no i'm sorry would play c4 here I, I, yeah this was an interesting line <laughs> and uh, i don't know who's better after all of this c4 queen takes c4 it's a pawn sacrifice but then uh, after the queen moves then e takes f4 is possible because there's no longer the mate threat the queen is not on this diagonal anymore um, so you can play rook e8 check king goes to h7 and uh, if the queen goes to d3 the queen will go to g6 and block so the, the line continues queen to g8 this may be something that uh, Grandelius didn't want to allow it looks pretty dangerous but uh, chess engines of course are never afraid <laughs> so rookie six check the line continues and um, then queen f6 and it seems like uh, black can hold this position so that's uh that's how the chess engine would deal with this uh, situation that's how it would, would deal with the magnus carlson's play here but uh, queen d8 was played in the game and now uh, rick takes e5 magnus has picked up a pawn of course he's uh given up the the b pawn but he picks up another one so net uh, he's gained a pawn and now he can just uh, press with this uh, slight advantage uh, let's see the queen went to a8 um, black has trying to get go for some counterplay the queen can come in uh, the king steps up to f2 f2 sorry uh, the rook drops back to b8 so defending the back rank so the queen is free to move um, the queen goes to f3 offering a queen trade but um, of course magnus would be happy to play this rick and pawn end game but the queen goes to a7 oops a7 i said the right word and moved to the wrong square queen goes to a7 uh, queen to d5 and queen to a1 now it goes in yeah i know the queen came in at some point um the chess engine does not like queen a1 it says that uh d3 should be played here this is a hard move to see d3 c takes d3 and queen to b6 so keeping the pin on this knight or this rook i mean and uh and maybe threatening to invade but it is a pawn sacrifice so now black is down two pawns but according to the chess engine black has chances to hold that anyway queen to a1 was played pretty natural move and queen to e5 preparing to gang up on uh, on this pawn queen to b2 looking at the c pawn there i guess and keeping in touch with this pawn rook to c6 king to h7 rook to c7 now now he's focusing on this pawn and the rook comes over so just these attacks with the pieces while keeping keeping the opponent's forces at bay uh, king rent to g2 queen to b4 queen to e4 check king to h8 so the uh, just a lot of maneuvering in this section rook to d7 now that this queen is no longer threatening to take here magnus can threaten to take uh, this pawn um, so queen to d2 check bringing back the threat on this pawn the king runs to h3 and uh, queen to uh, d1 maybe hoping to get some kind of perpetual here with the queen going back and forth but uh, rook to e7 was played queen to h5 check and uh, king to g2 and now the queen can't come back here with check can only go back to uh, uh, d1 so uh, rook to c8 was played now the uh, 
now that this uh, pawn is no longer, it's only attacked by one piece, so it's adequately defended. Uh, F5, pushing on, queen back to D1, rook to E8 check, forcing the exchange. And now we're down to a queen and pawn endgame. King goes back to H7, queen to E4, king back to H8, getting away from the discovered check, queen to E8 check, little back and forth, king to H7. Magnus doesn't want to draw, so he goes to uh, g6. Ah, right, he had pushed that pawn forward, so it, g6 is a safe square for the queen. Um, the king goes back, and now pawn to f6, so trying to get something going here. This queen goes to e2, and then uh, checks from e6, and then takes. So uh, uh, Grandelius has gotten a pawn back, but his king is in kind of sad shape here. Uh, queen takes h6 check, king g8, queen g6 check, king f8, running out of the corner. Now g4, queen e5. Sorry, I did that wrong. Queen e5. Uh, h3, so attacking the pawn, so king to e7, queen f5, queen e3, keeping keeping the queens on, that's, that's uh, black's hope for a draw is to maintain the force on the board. King to uh, h5 here, a very interesting move, allowing the check and giving a pawn back again, so we're back to 2 to 2, king runs around to g6, but now ganging up on this pawn. Uh, king goes to d6, running away, king takes f6, queen goes to e3, g5, queen e7 check, king runs to g6, queen e8 check, king runs to g7, queen e7 check, and uh, king goes to g8. And at this point, uh, Grandelius resigned. Um, if the queens come off, this is a winning king and pawn endgame, so there's a threat of queen here check, and that would force a queen trade. And uh, as long as white is close enough to the pawn to save it, so black doesn't get to capture it, then that's a win for white, which is true in this case. And uh, there's no more uh, checks. The problem with the remaining checks is that uh, black checks on the back rank, for example, here or here, um, White can block and block with check because that will hit uh, Black's king there, and that will also uh, provoke a trade. And uh, it looks like the uh, pawn is close enough to um, to queening. After that, that uh, that'll be a win for White. Okay, so uh, that's it for this game. That was kind of a long long game there, but uh, the next one is kind of a short and sweet one. So uh, stay tuned for that. The next game I wanted to show you was played in uh, 2019 at the London Classic between Magnus Carlsen and Levon Aronian. So Carlsen with the white pieces again. Aronian plays a Sicilian. And in fact, uh, we get the same line that we saw. Uh, well, the same opening. We'll get a knight orf again that we saw in the previous game. So everything is normal up to this point. And uh, Aronian plays a6, the characteristic knight orf move. And in the last game against Nils Grandelius, we saw Carlsen play uh, queen to d3. He has another offbeat idea in this move. In this game, he plays uh, a3, <laughs> also a rare move. Um, uh, you, h3 is seen occasionally to be followed by g4. That's become a bit trendy in recent years, but uh, a3 never really caught on. Uh, so. Uh, Aronian continues with g6. I think, um, you know, the disadvantage of playing this way with these offbeat moves is that you don't get much, much of an advantage out of the opening. So black, you know, gets a comfortable position here. Uh, and both sides can make the normal Sicilian move. So bishop e3, setting up this triangle of pieces here. Very characteristic. Uh, b5, harassing the knight on the uh, queen side here. 
sometimes a3 is played at this point to stop this pawn from coming forward so i guess you could say a3 was just played in advance anyway queen d queen uh, d2 is played and h5 uh, Aronian goes for expansion on the king side here a4 undermining the pawns but they just uh, come forward the knight kicking the knight back and then trying to lock it in but uh, Carlson strikes back with c3 so this knight is not going to stay in prison uh, pawn takes and uh, there's a clever little intermediate move here he could just uh, take back right away but he throws in this move bishop b5 because that's with check and then when uh, this bishop comes out to block the check knight takes c3 brings another defender to this square so uh, a nice little sequence there but Aronian just castles Magnus castles and um, knight to a6 was played with all of these pieces pointed at the c6 square the normal knight c6 move is just not available for black so maybe that's one of the points of the way that uh, Magnus is playing here but uh, the knight hops out to a6 and then when the knight leaves suddenly this c6 square is available for Magnus and he hops his knight in there so interesting little play but it just gets uh, traded off but now Magnus does have the bishop pair, so that's a little something. Rook to b8, getting away from the bishop, of course, but also focusing on a weakness in uh, White's camp. Uh, the bishop just drops back to b5, shielding the b-pawn. Um, knight runs out to c5, so it's found itself a good square. And then rook a to d1. Queen to c7, getting away from uh, a rook on the d-file um, and now here we've reached that point where basically both sides have completed their development and they're looking around for plans and uh, Magnus Carlsen starts with king to h1 so this is uh, one of those moves I would classify as a small strengthening move um, it's not uh, there was no immediate threat to the king but uh, this diagonal is open and there's no pawn on it and when the king when this bishop leaves that there will be maybe a check here at some point so just uh moving the king to the side getting away from any future difficulties and waiting to see what uh what black is doing well black still has good developing moves to play black can play rook f to d8 and does now bishop to g5 so now we see that the bishop did want to leave that diagonal so there's no check here um but this move is a bit of a, a nothing move too the bishop is going from here to here so sliding along its diagonal and you'll see it actually comes back to that square later uh, and it's not making much of a threat here uh, maybe it's tying down this bishop for fear of a trade causing some pawn damage but this bishop isn't moving right away and this knight might move at some point but on the other hand black does have to uh, find a move so uh, black plays queen to a7 and now Magnus goes queen to f2 so shuffling his queen to the side but also putting it in contact with uh, with uh, not in contact in opposition to black's queen so this uh, knight is actually pinned by that move um, then rook d to c8 was played adding another defender to the knight and bishop to e3 so well now that there's a pin there Magnus starts to uh, increase the pressure so the shuffling phase is done and uh, now Magnus is looking at the position and seeing if there's uh, there's things that he can exploit or poke at um, so bishop to e3 poking at this uh, knight here and uh, making it feel a little uncomfortable because of the pin and Aronian plays a very natural move queen to c7 to just get out of the pin and solidly protect that night and unfortunately for Aronian that was actually a fatal move and the game is over so if you want some time if you want take some time here and see uh, you know you've, you've you've played your small moves you played your nothing moves and your opponent has made the mistake that you're hoping to trick him into or induce and uh, but you know you have to recognize it and uh, you have to find that move that is really going to exploit the mistake so what is the best move for white in this position yeah pause the video and uh, think about it for a bit or if you want time to think about it 
I'm going to give the answer away now. I might have spotted some of these ideas, but certainly not all of them. It's a very tricky position. But uh, the move is e5. That uh, you might have guessed that it's it's kind of a natural looking move. It's uh, it's hitting this knight and hitting this pawn. But uh, the the first point is that you actually cannot take the pawn because you lose a piece here. And uh, if the queen takes back, this is a tactic you should be able to spot. <laughs> white to move. What does white play in this position? Okay, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm giving the answer away now. The answer is rook here check. This is a, a, hook, a hook and ladder trick. This is like uh, you're, you're yanking away the support from this queen, which will be stuck up here without any support. So if rook takes rook, queen takes queen. You're just up a rook for a queen. And then we can back up if... Um, what else? He's in check. So if the king runs or if the check is blocked, then you can take the queen. Because if rook takes rook, you've got rook takes rook, and you've just won a rook. So you win something, some major material in any case. So so basically, uh, black just cannot take that knight back. And if black can't take the knight, then it means that black can't take the pawn uh, because he loses the knight. So this knight has to move. So Aronian figured this out, played knight h7. And now comes the uh, second half of the tactic which uh, is the part I would not have seen. I might have seen that hook and ladder. I'm pretty familiar with that tactic. So this starts with knight d5. And you'll see the point of this pawn push, the second point of the pawn push, other than to offer that tactic, was to chase that knight away so that this knight could come here. And so the knight uh, can't get traded off. The queen has to move. And now the knight can sacrifice itself here. And this is a very forcing sacrifice because uh, the knight is forking the uh, king and the rook. So what to do? You have to take the knight if you don't want to be down material. And then um, white gets this tremendous pawn. And in fact, in every line, white white gets the material back. So uh, white is just winning. Uh, the queen has to move. That's a defended pawn. And uh, also the knight is hanging. There's two pieces attacking the knight and only one defending. So the queen comes up here to e5 to defend. Magnus kicks the queen again. The queen steps to the side to defend and then pushes on with d5. The final blow. Um, if the rook steps to the side, then once again this knight is undefended. So uh, uh, bishop takes knight will happen. And um, let's see uh, what else might black try here. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. If the, if the if the rook comes forward, then the pawn goes forward and um, the pawn comes forward and queens it, so that wins at least a rook. Um, you know, the knight could take the pawn, but the bishop takes knight or rook takes knight, I guess, is even better. And, uh, and so uh, white has gotten the material back and has the bishop pair and an extra pawn. So that is just winning for white. Uh, Aronian tried something tricky. He tried a, a counterattack with uh, knight to e4, hitting the queen. But, uh, well, you can take this rook and promote with check. So uh, let's see, how did how did Aronian take back? Aronian took back with the queen. And then Carlson just played queen f3 to get his queen out of trouble. And uh, Aronian didn't give up right away. He played on another uh, 17 moves, it looks like. Uh, no, 14. Another 14 moves he played on. But it's all over. Uh, white is up in exchange and uh, a pawn. I guess uh, black can grab this pawn here. But uh, white is just up in exchange and has the bishop pair as well. So that's uh, winning. Yeah, actually, I don't think there's time to take the pawn because this knight is hanging <laughs> on top of everything else. So I think black could have resigned here with a clear conscience. Anyway, I'll have pointers to these games uh, if you want to check them out yourself and see how this one ended. But uh, that's it for this video. And uh, that's that's a nice example of how this uh, doing nothing strategy can pay off. It, it kind of depends on uh, your opponent making a mistake. But, uh, you know, in complicated positions, people make mistakes. So you just have to be alert 
and ready to capitalize on them when they do occur. Um, so that not only finishes this uh, uh, top 10 middle game idea number 10, but it also finishes the whole series. So I thought I would um, uh, give you some pointers, uh, things you might want to look at uh, to uh, follow up and learn more about the mid middle game. So I think uh, the best way to um, improve your middle game play is to study the games of strong players and uh, just enrich your uh, your uh, internal database of uh, middle game plans. Just uh, look for what they are doing in the middle game and see if you can uh, you know incorporate those ideas in your own play. So there's a lot of resources on YouTube uh, players that will document uh, top level games. I think the the premier one is uh, Daniel King's channel. Uh, power play chess where he uh, uh, documents games goes over games from uh, recent tournaments and sometimes historical games he did a nice series on Bobby Fischer so that's a good source of ideas I like um, also the analysis of uh, uh, Christoph Selecki chess explained he's an international master and he does uh, quite a good job uh, recently I noticed uh, also that um, the chess club and scholastic center of Atlanta has been uh, running a series of videos uh, about uh, understanding chess middle games based on the book by John Nunn. That's uh, Spencer Feingold, who is a uh, master and uh, uh, the son of Ben Feingold. Uh, it does the an, uh, overview, does the coverage of the book and uh, uh, goes over some of those ideas. And then uh, the last one here, this one is not so well known, but uh, there's a chess channel called MSK Chess uh, MSK, I think, stands for Mir Sultan Khan, but um, who's a, a famous uh, player from the 30s, but um, 1930s. <laughs> I should be clear. Uh, um, but anyway, the, the, the guy behind that channel uh, puts a lot of effort into his videos and he focuses on the middle game. He's not so active right now, but there's a long uh, series of uh, games there on different middle game topics and uh, a long series of videos on different middle game topics and example games so that's a good resource um, when you're studying the games of strong players you can also just uh, find the games and look at them yourself try to analyze them um, you should look for a player who's um, who plays the same openings as you or who has a style that you would like to play that you admire and want to play that way and then you know see what you can learn by uh, by going over their games and you can find these games, um, you know, there's an online resource at uh, chessgames.com, chessgames the last item on the list here on this page. And um, they have uh, all the games from recent tournaments. You can go on there. There are some features you have to be a subscriber to get access to, but uh, just basically looking at, just uh, looking at the games is free for everyone and looking at games from recent tournaments. So you can see what the top players are playing these days by looking at these tournament games and seeing if there's anything that catches your eyes, a player or a uh, opening that you would like to learn more about. Or you can um, go and buy software. There's chess uh, database software. The premier source of that is the company Chessbase. It's a bit expensive, but uh, it's, uh, you know, if you're serious about it and you have the money, <laughs> you want to uh, spend the time investigating that, it can be a worthwhile investment. You can search for games by, by position, by, uh, by uh, uh, player, and uh, many other things. It's, it's really quite, quite um, extensive what you can do. In fact, I plan to do some uh, software reviews coming up, so I'll, I'll cover that in a future video, give you some idea of what you can do with that. And then lastly, there's uh, books. So I divided the books into uh, two categories. There's the books that I have and then the books that I haven't read yet. <clears throat> and um, so these are the books I have that I thought were good and they have to do with the middle game. Um, the first one, My System by Aaron Nemzovich. It's a bit of a controversial recommendation because I've heard a lot of strong players uh, say it's a bad idea for uh, to, to read that book. <laughs> they really dissed it. Um, the problem is it's a little bit out of date uh, and he's pretty dogmatic. So you have to uh, take everything he says with a grain of salt. But uh, the positive aspect of it is that it's um, he's, a, he's a, a real font of ideas and he has a great uh, way of expressing himself. So 
if you're ever you know at a loss for what to do in the middle game, if you're often at a loss for what to do in the middle game, this is one way to cure that because he's he's got tons of ideas in there, and uh, there will always be an idea from that book that applies to whatever middle game you might find yourself in. So I think I can recommend it from that point of view. The danger is that um, uh, particularly if you're you're you know an improving player, shall I say. Um, you might focus too much on the ideas when what you really need to focus on is tactics. So everybody needs uh, to have a strong tactical foundation to really be able to apply these middle game ideas. And, uh, and so reading this book too soon can, uh, can be, you know, putting things in the wrong order. You should really get strong tactically, <clears throat> get strong tactically, and then, uh, and then read a book like this to, uh, to round out your, your ideas about what to play in the middle game. But but if you're short of ideas, it's a, a great book. And uh, he introduces a lot of terms that are used in other discussions about chess. So it'll, it'll introduce you to chess culture. <laughs> and the second book is um, the Zurich International Chess Tournament, 1953 by Bronstein. Um, you could say the same thing about this book as well. I just wanted to point out that Bronstein in particular, there were other books written about this tournament but Bronstein in particular was interested in the middle game. And so he tried to turn uh, each, each uh, long comment, uh, uh, commentary on, on each game into a little bit of a, a, dis, a dissertation on the middle game. Uh, so it's, it's very uh, middle game focused, pretty interesting for a tournament book. And uh, I liked it so much I did a video series on the book where I just took uh, one game from each round of the tournament for my series, uh, Bronstein comments, on all the games, but you can check out my videos if you want to get a taste for what's in there. Uh, and then there's a couple of books that I haven't read but have been recommended to me. The first one, Secrets of Grandmaster Chess, was recommended as kind of an antidote to the Bronstein and Demzovich books. <laughs> so this maybe you can think of that as bringing it up to date and uh, you know kind of throwing out some of the old ideas and bringing in some of the new ideas. So uh, maybe it's a better book to read. And, and some of these recommendations. You can check it out and see what you think. Uh, and then there's uh, New York 1924 by Alexander Lechen. It's uh, also a tournament book, similar to the Zurich book by Bronstein. Uh, and it, there was another one on New York 1927. Apparently he did a good job in uh, annotating those games. So uh, I don't know uh, much about those because I haven't read those books, but they have been recommended to me. And I thought I would just pass those recommendations along. Okay, so that's it for this video and for the series. I hope you guys uh, have fun in your continuing uh, chess journey, and I will see you around. Bye.